That's not how the story ends. And three days later, he rose again. That's love. And if Christ is still dead, then we are a pity people. We have no hope if Christ is still in the grave. But we have a resurrected Savior who's alive. And therefore, even though we die, our hope is that we shall be raised again. We shall finally see the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And that's our hope in the face of death, in the face of suffering, in the face of sorrow. And that is really, really, really good news. So what we're going to do is talk about that. I don't know if you've paid attention today, but all of our songs, for the most part, have been about hope in the face of death. And that's been intentional. Because today we're about to go into a house of mourning, into a church in mourning. And we're going to see Jesus, or Paul, by way of Jesus, speak hope into their grief and into their sorrow. So pray with me, and then I'm going to read, and we're going to jump in together. Father, I pray that uh, right now you will meet us, that even as we have worshipped you and have, have oftentimes have, have had our faith stirred with things that we want to believe, I pray that you will help our unbelief. But I do pray now that you would speak to your people. Your word is truth. Your word is God-breathed. Your word is powerful. Your word, as it works by your spirit, can bring conviction. It can bring comfort. It can bring hope. I do pray right now that as we read it, as we listen to it preached, and even as I open my mouth, may this be about Jesus and all about Jesus. And may your saints be encouraged. I pray in his name. Amen. So if you've been with us uh, since February, we've been working through First Thessalonians. We are actually in the home stretch. So we're going to finish up chapter four today. We'll jump into chapter five next week and hopefully finish it within two, three weeks. So uh, just to sort of set the stage. So Paul has shifted. So first he talked about holiness and, and loving one another by way of um, sexuality. And then he moved out of there and he moved into what does it mean to love one another in the life of the body of Christ? And then he also talked about what does it mean to walk wisely amongst outsiders? So if you remember, I've named this series the Anchored and Expectant Church. In other words, part of this book is about anchoring us in the midst of afflictions and persecutions. But the other part of this, is it's about the expectancy that we can have, the future that that's bright for God's people. Well, that's what we're about to dive into for the next few weeks. We're looking at the future. We're looking at what awaits us. We're looking at the hope that we have for tomorrow, no matter what happens to us today. And it's really, really, really good news. So this week, God wants you to sit and he wants you and I to be comforted with hope because of Jesus's return. Next week, because Jesus is returning, that ought to make us busy. It ought to break into our here and now and change what we value and change how we live. So this week, sit, be comforted. Next week, there's work for us to do. So I just want you to hear both things, right? So this is the word. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 19, 18. This is the word of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, then we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. When was the last time that you had a brush with death? I see it every morning. I look at, I go through my phone and I see older pictures of me when I had no gray hair 
And we're talking about like four years ago, five years ago. And then I get in the mirror now and I'm just snow white, especially like right down here. And I'm tempted to kind of diet, you know, like I want to diet. And, 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 and every time I get tempted to kind of like do it, I, I feel this. What are you trying to cover up? You are aging and you are dying and you need to deal with it. What about if you were texting and driving or looking at your phone or driving in a distracted manner and you run off the road? You know that feeling? I'm, I'm, I'm confessing that I've done that. I, I probably shouldn't. But I, I've done that. I've driven my car in a distracted manner. And it's almost just it's just crazy. Or what about if you're a kid and you're outside playing and you're running and riding your bike and you stumble across a dead squirrel? And like when you see that, like in your mind, like, you know that he needs to be crawling, like he needs to be moving and going up a tree. And there is something about this dead animal on the ground that it stops you in your tracks. That what about maybe if you've been to the doctor and there's an unfavorable report? And all of a sudden your countenance falls. What about when you realize that this is another birthday and another birthday and, 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 and you have You've lived longer than you will be alive. That you know without a shadow of a doubt that your 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 longer days are behind you. What about when you hear of a classmate who's your exact age? And they've died. Like in all of those moments that that I think we will be wise to stop and to listen. And to pay attention. Because I think it's easy to live as if tomorrow is already promised. It's easy to live as if we're invincible. And I say this to even younger people who are in college. Your group, you, you think that your whole life is before you. Until and, and I've seen it, I've been in college ministry. I've had a student die in a car accident, a student get cancer and die. A student commits suicide and dies. And so you're not immune just because you're young. And that's why the author of Ecclesiastes, he says this. He says, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Why? It's because the living discern that this too is their end. Think about what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying. That when you go to an NBA game, that you see might and strength and stamina and vigor. You see life. You see all of that. And it's easy to get wrapped up in that and think that those men are invincible, that these times will never expire. And the author of Ecclesiastes says, no, given a choice, it's better to go here. Why? Because that's temporary. Those are mortal men. They're going to die. He says it's better to go to a house of mourning because this is what happens. In encounters with death, you and I face our mortality in a way that you don't in any other setting. That when you go into a funeral home, and you watch a family grieving, if you listen quietly and carefully enough, death is saying, your turn is coming. And I want to convince you that it's not death talking. It's your gracious God sparing your life through these incidents and you see death enough until it sinks in that I have a day. Now, that pushes us in a place, right? It makes us uncomfortable. We're supposed to be here celebrating. Why are you talking about death and dying and grieving? You live long enough. And you will. And if we're honest, that's where this church is. They're in this house of mourning. And Paul wants us to walk in there with them and to see and to see their grief. He wants to paint a picture 
that death is strong and grief is real. But he also has good news in this text. That Christ is stronger and our hope is certain. That you have to see both of these things. You cannot numb this down over here and deny this, because if you deny the depth and the need that we have when we face an enemy that's stronger than us, if we dumb this down, then we simultaneously dumb down the power of Christ. But if you can enter into grief and enter into suffering and enter into your mortality and enter into your powerlessness, then his strength is made perfect. And it's not I mean, that's a big deal that we have to get to this place where we see that there is something bigger and stronger and mightier than us because that humbles us. But it simultaneously exalts his strength and his might. So that's what I want us to look at is these two things. And you see it in the text. First, let's look at this whole idea of death and grief. You see it in verse 13. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep right there, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Grieve as others do who have no hope. The people who have no hope have no Christ. And because they have no Christ, then death is a tyrant. Now, what's happened here is that Paul has sent Timothy and we looked at that in chapter two and chapter three. He sent Timothy to this church and Timothy goes to this church and he, he, he goes back to this church that they planted and he starts to, 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 to spend time with them. And then that's why Paul writes that Timothy has come back and Timothy has told us that you're standing firm in the faith. And then Paul writes, but Timothy has told me these things. Timothy has told me about your sexuality. Timothy has told me about some of y'all not working. Timothy has told me about some of y'all behaving unwisely amongst outsiders. And Timothy has also told me about the way you're grieving. And what, what Timothy tells Paul is that Paul, they're grieving like outsiders. That their, their grief is hopeless right now. That Timothy probably went in this church and he he would have went there and, and, and wanted to see other Christians. And he would have saw a lot of them, but some of them were missing. Like, where is Dan and where is Lydia and where is Michael? Like, where are they? And then the church tells them they're dead, Paul. I mean, Timothy. And then it showed in their grief that the way that they were grieving, they were their grief was no different from outsiders. The gospel was not informing their grief. And that's why Paul writes them back. I don't want you grieving like them. Now, we got to dive into grief and we have to dive into death, because if you're honest, like it does really feel heavy and weighty and powerful. Even the strongest people, the most organized people. That it, when the death of a loved one happens, their homes aren't cleaned up. They struggle to eat and to take care of themselves. They struggle to be motivated to even live. Why? Like, why is grief so hard? The first thing is that I think this separation, it really is like a the tearing of the soul. So you think about when when marriage and this is just one example where God says that a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two will become one flesh. In other words, there's a oneness that happens in marriage. And I would push that, that 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 oneness. I mean, it is preeminent in marriage, but you see it even through birth. You see a child being birthed out of a mother. Right. You, you, you see these familiar relationships and these friendships that, that, that there's a oneness that happens and, and death. It really is the tearing of souls apart. Now, I don't know if you, you keep up with in the metal in the medical field, but there's some there's this phenomenon. It's really rare, but it, it's you have conjoined twins and these are, are, are babies who were born and they're like connected to one another. And some of them are connected, you know, with their skull. Some of them are connected with their torso. I mean, there's all types of ways that they're born. And what happens, though, is that that when they want to split the two of them, they will bring in a world renowned medical team. 
And this medical team will do scans and body scans and CAT scans. And these medical teams will do, use imagery and they will rotate it and, and try to figure out how these two people are connected. And then they will venture into a 20 to 20, I mean, I mean 30 hour surgery of just trying to neatly and richly and, and in a manner that preserves life, they're trying to separate. And so they won't cut here, but they'll cut here and they won't do this and they'll reroute this artery this way. And, and they're using all of this technology to neatly separate two people that are joined together. And let me tell you what happens at death. Death is not neat. It feels like a tearing of the soul with parts of you that are gone with the other person. And that is what makes it hard. That oftentimes the separation, it's on a soul level. That it's hard to move on because a part of you is gone. That's what makes it hard. But there's also this idea that, that, that we were made, right, for presence. We were made not just proximity to be near someone, but to be with them in an intimate way. And so you see it when people die, the last thing they want is more stuff. What they miss is relationships and, and people. And so now there's this void that's there, this, this internal void, this companionship that, that, that's missing, that's been there forever. There's a guy, he wrote a book, he lost a son when he was 25. His son died in a mountain climbing accident. The name of the book is Lament for a Son. And so what I thought about doing was trying to like, okay, let me read about grief. And then I said, you know what, man, just go talk to somebody who's grieving. And so this guy wrote a book. It's kind of his diary. It's his whole encounter with how he's feeling at the death of a son. And listen to what he says. Absence is the new normal. This person is gone from the face of the earth. I wait for a group of students to cross the street where he used to attend college, thinking that he'll be in that group. I go to a ball game. I visit ball games. I mean, I, I, I go to a ball game and I single out every 25 year old there. And none of them is he. And all the crowds and all the streets and all the rooms and all the churches. Whenever I go to the mall, whenever we gather as friends in our world, I will not find him, only his absence. When we gather now as a family, there is something missing. No, there is someone missing. His absence is as present as our presence. His silence is as loud as our speech. You hear what he's saying? He's, he's wrestling through this void that's there. That it's vacuum, that 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 his presence, like right, the fact that he's not present, it's actually like he's present. Like it, it's weird that his silence is actually communicating something, it's screaming something at me. Like I'm used to seeing him at the table, I'm used to hearing his voice, and now it's nothing. He says that neverness is a real feeling. He says, I could take a month, I could take a year, I could take five years. With that, I could live, but this feels like forever. Never at the dinner table, never on a family vacation, never to hear their laugh or see their smile, never to watch them leave for school. All the rest of my life, I must live without him, and only my death can stop the pain of his death. This is a father grieving, adding layers and depth and texture to this power of death. What also makes it hard is the unknown. We're a predictable people. Some of us get up at the same time. Our clothes are arranged the same way. Some of us drive the same way to school, that, that there is something we flourish where there is stability and predictability. That when we can see and know things, we thrive and death is the unknown. Like we, we don't have a clue with what's going on. That makes it hard. And I push that a bit further. 
if you think about it long and hard enough, what makes it also hard is that you will die. That you start to step back and realize that every one of us alive in this room right now from the baby that's in the stomach of a mother right now to our oldest member in here at the moment, that there will come a day when not one single person in this room will be alive on this earth. And your money can't defeat it. You can crossfit 10 days a week <laughs> and your body will still betray you. You can live in a gated community free from all robbers and invaders and death will still invade your house. That it is relentless and it has a 100 percent kill rate. It never misses. Ever. Now, the question we have to step back and say, well, why is it so pervasive if death is so strong and no one is immune to it? Then why? Like, why is it happening? And if you know the rest of the Bible, then you know the wages of sin is death. That we die because we sin. We are and we sin because we're sinners. We have been born in iniquity. We come here inheriting the sin nature of Adam and then we work it out in our own lives. And what's waiting, the, the wages that we get, what we earn by our actions is death because God is holy and he must punish sin. And so what this means is I can tell you that, that whenever somebody dies, normally my sister is the first person to know. If there's like a classmate, I don't know how she knows it, but she'll, she'll send me a text. You heard about so-and-so? And I'm like, man, I don't, don't tell. I don't want to know. Like, but here's the thing. My next question, my next response is how they die. And my, my next question is always how and what happened. And here's the thing. I know the answer. Sin happened. That's the reason. That's the ultimate reason we die. That, yes, you can die in a car accident. Yes, you can be texting and driving and swerve off. Yes, you can get cancer. But cancer is not the ultimate killer of God's people. It's our sin. And so think about when you go buy your bag lettuce from Sam's or from Kroger. Right. And you've seen the recall where you buy this lettuce and it's ready made and, and you get this recall, recall alert. And then now you're going to you're going to the to the refrigerator. You're looking like, wait a minute, is, is my lettuce in that lot? And so they narrow it down. All right. It was lettuce sold at Kroger. Then they narrow it down more. Lettuce sold at Kroger between these days. Then lettuce sold at Kroger between these days from this brand. And then once you get this brand, then they isolate it to the actual plant where they put this stuff together. And then once they isolate that, they go down right to the line. They know the very line that was contaminated and there's tracking numbers on there so that your food can be tracked right down to the line. And then once they isolate the line, then they go through quality, quality assurance where they're trying to figure out what happened. So, yes, you died of food poisoning, but there was something way upstream that contaminated the entire supply chain. And so what killed you? Was it salmonella? Probably so. But something back there caused it. That's what Paul is saying. How you die is secondary. When you die is secondary. That you will die because of our sinful nature. That's primary. Now, here's the thing. I know this feels heavy. It feels weighty. But that's what this church is in the midst of. And we have to sit here and let that let that shock us a little bit. We're fit. We're young. We work out. We eat right. We may suppress the reality that we're dying. We may push it out of our minds and not think about it. We may make up rap songs and say, hey, there's a heaven for a G. No, it's not. It's one heaven. <laughs> we, we, we do all this. We do all this kind of stuff. To, we do all this kind of stuff to, like, make this neat, and it's not neat, and it's not normal. This is a defect. This was not the intention of Christ. 
Now, once you're there and you kind of are, are in that place where you're lowered and you kind of see your own mortality, now we're able to, to, to stare into hope. I love this passage. Paul does not say do not grieve. He says do not grieve as those who have no hope. So grieving is real. Feel it. Pondering your mortality is important. Think about it. But there's hope. There's a lot of hope in this passage. As a matter of fact, he spends the rest of the passage pulling them out of grief by way of the gospel. Now, what I want to do is, is, is look at this hope under these uh, under a few headings, just so you and I can see everything Paul does to sort of pull them back. He says, I'm going to pull you out of the pit. I'm going to pull you and pull you and pull you and pull you. And then you're going to wake up and, and you're going to have comfort. You're going to have real hope. Well, how does Paul present Jesus as stronger and how does he present our hope as unshakable in this text? He does it a few ways. The first way is his vocabulary, that when you look at the text, study it carefully. Notice how he refers to those who have died. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep. Look down in, in verse 14. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Look at the end of verse uh, 6, 15, that who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And so three times in this passage, he refers to them. They are dead. And yet he strategically calls them asleep. This is exactly what Jesus did with Lazarus. You remember that passage where Jesus is with the disciples and he tells them we need to go down to Bethany for Lazarus is asleep. And the disciples, I mean, they hear him say that. And what how do they respond? They're like, Master, if he's asleep, we don't need to go down there. He can just wake up. And then what does Jesus do? And then Jesus says, let me tell it to you plainly. Lazarus is dead, really dead, three days dead in the cave, in a tomb now, stinking dead, like he's really dead. But I'm going to go wake him up. Now, how can he do it? Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Mary and Martha, yes, I know, I know he'll be raised on the day, of, uh, on the last day. And then what Jesus is saying is that I'm the day. That that day in and of itself, it is not special. It's special because I'm there. And that's my day. On my day, I will flex my muscle and I will show you my strength and my power and my might. But what happens when you take the man of that day and you put him right here in time and space in Lazarus's grief? What happens? The same power that Jesus has on that future day, he has right now. So he walks to the tomb and he tells Lazarus what? Come out. And Lazarus does what? He comes out. Why? He's the resurrection. He's the life. That's how Paul describes them in this text. He says, brothers and sisters, they are asleep, awaiting the call of Christ out of their graves. What Lazarus, what happened to Lazarus was not an anomaly. It is the new norm for every believer. Christ will wake them up. That's good news, but it gets a little better, right? So that's one thing, his vocabulary. The second thing you see in the text is this, this whole idea of this, this sense of being, of union with Christ. Now, if you've been reading your Bible, then you know that there is one instance in this text where Paul calls them dead. Look at the end of verse 16. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And so you're like, ah, oh, I got you. I got you. Like he called them dead. I thought you said he called them asleep. He calls them dead. Well, notice the rest of that. They're dead. What? In Christ. He does not call them dead. They are dead in Jesus. Now, look at the other text. The only other time he uses dead in the passage, he says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So what is he saying? He is saying that Christ has tasted death. We no longer die. We're in him. We're united to him. We have a savior who has cut the path, so to speak. 
We have a Savior who has already went into the ground and died, and our death has been reckoned in his. I don't know if you know who Dickie Simpkins is, right? Most of you don't, and that's, that's perfect. He actually played with the Chicago Bulls back in the Jordan days. And what you might not know about Dickie Simpkins is that he has two championship rings with the Bulls. And you want to know how much playing time he got in the playoffs? Zero. He didn't make a point. He didn't play a minute. He didn't block a shot. He didn't get a steal. He didn't get an assist. He did nothing. <laughs> and yet he earned, I mean, he actually, I mean, go, go look him up. He earned a ring. How do you earn a ring and you do nothing? Because you wore the same jersey that they wore. You were on their team. And the work of Jordan and the work of Kukok and the work of Kerr and the work of Pippen and the work of Horace Grant. I can keep going on and on and on. All of those men won the games. He was a bench rider. He wasn't even on the playing team. And because of their union with Jordan, <laughs> he got it. Look, that's what's going on in this passage. God don't need you to fight death. You can't. But we're united to Christ by faith. And whatever Christ has won, it's ours. Not by works, but through faith. Think about that, that you are so united to Christ that everything that Jesus did by way of obedience, it's counted, it's credited as if you obeyed. And everything that he suffered, it's counted as if God has taken out his wrath upon you. And his death and his descent into the grave, it's counted as if you really did die. And his resurrection from the grave, it's counted as if you are really resurrected. And so that when your body goes into the ground, it is not punitive in the sense Jesus has paid it for you. You unite it to Christ. And so what this means is that death and grief and sorrow, it can touch a whole lot of stuff. It can make settling your estate a nightmare if you don't have a will. It can bring heartache upon your husband or your wife if you go out before them. It can scar your children. It can really do a lot of damage here. But one place it cannot damage, it will not damage, it will not touch is your union with Jesus. It stays intact no matter what happens. And that is good news. That's why I had Zach read Psalm 116. It's as precious in the sight of the Lord or the death of his saints. How in the world is dying precious in the sight of the Lord? We get to see him. The work of Christ can be accrued to us. We get to behold him. But that's not the only thing that Paul does to encourage us in the passage. There is something about the future. and We're going to deal with the future that day. But their questions seem to be along the lines of what's happening in the present. In other words, when he keeps saying, I don't want you to be informed about those who have fallen asleep. And he, he gives us all of this, this information about the people who have died. In other words, I think their question is, what's happening to them? Will they miss out on the last day? And what Paul is saying is, no, they won't. They actually have a special day on the last day, a special place on the last day. And you see it in the text. Now, you, were, you would think that when you read this, that you would think that Paul would write, for since we believe that Christ died and was raised again, then we also believe that those who have died in Christ will be raised. You would think that that's what he's saying. Now, he says that later in the verse that we, the dead in Christ will be raised. But follow the logic of this sentence in verse 14. Look at what he says. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again right there, even so, 
through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, hold that thought right there. Now, turn back over to chapter three. Go down to verse 13. This is not the first time Paul has done this. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and father. What does it say? At the coming of our Lord Jesus with who? With all his saints. So two times in this letter, in Paul's mind, what he's saying is this. When believers die, their bodies go into the ground. That is true. But their souls go to be with their maker. And when Jesus returns back on the last day, guess who is going to be with him? The souls of the saints. In other words, they are never out of the presence of the Lord. That right now, those who have died in Christ are in what theologians call the intermediate state. That, that you think about, they're not living, right? They're not alive and they're not sinning. Their bodies are in the grave. And yet... Their bodies are there and their souls and their spirits. Where where are they? They are with Jesus right now. But they're waiting. That's why in the book of Revelation, the saints say, how long, O Lord, how long will you avenge our blood? That even in heaven right now, there is this temporary separation between body and soul. And yet just getting them to heaven is not Jesus's ambition. God will give him the name above every name. And at the name of Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess even on the earth and under the earth. So the goal of salvation is not just saving us. The goal is the restoration of all things that Christ might be preeminent that he might be the last one to stand on the earth and that everything and everyone will bow in worship and that creation will be made new and our bodies will be snatched out of the grave and united with our souls and we will be with our Savior in his presence forever and ever and ever and ever. That's where it's going. And so those who have died in Christ, they're waiting. Lord, how long? How long before my body gets back? How long before the creation sees the full revelation of who the sons and daughters of God are? How long, how long, how long? And what that means, those who have fallen asleep, their souls are right there with them. And look at this text. Notice what Paul says is going to happen on that last day. Paul says, no, they're not going to miss out. As a matter of fact, we're missing out on something. Then look at the order. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed that the dead in Christ will rise first. So their bodies will rise out of the ground and then Christ will be bringing them with him, their souls. And then what does he say? They will rise first. They will be united. And then and then and then we who are alive, who are left will be caught up. God is going to make you, if we are fortunate enough to be alive when Jesus returns, even though we never taste death, the Bible reads as if we're still going to have to watch Christ flex his muscle and show us that he can beat death. We're going to be here waiting our turn, trying to get in. And, and, and Jesus says, nope, you got to wait. Let me show you just in case you don't know it. I have the power over death. Hey, all of y'all get up. All of y'all be united, be glorified. Now it's your turn. That's beautiful, right? And it's not just that. Like he just keeps adding it. And then he says, and then we will be with them. So there is this sense in which heaven is going to be the best family reunion you ever had. All the ribs, all the chicken, all the catfish, all of the meat. I mean, just it is going to be amazing. And it's going to be no beef, no drama. Ain't nobody shooting. Ain't no. I mean, it's, it's just gonna, it's just this amazing family reunion. And we will be with them forever. But it gets better. You will see your loved ones. You will know them. And then he says, and we will be with the Lord forever. 
It's not just about seeing mom and dad. It's about seeing Jesus. And Paul says you will see him and be with him forever. And then he drops the mic. He says there's nothing else to say. It's like you can't add to that. You cannot add to everything that he's just said. And then he finally gets to this pinnacle and he says, you will be with Jesus forever. Drops the mic and says, OK, now go encourage one another with these words. Christians, we're in Jesus. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. You don't have to be afraid of death. That whether you live, you're the Lord's, whether you die, you're the Lord's, whether you live or you die, you belong to the Lord. He will not abandon your soul to hell. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He told the thief on the cross, today when you die, you will be with me in paradise. Your body will stay on this cross, but you will be with me forever. And I will glorify you even as the Father has glorified me. He says, encourage one another with these words. Sit down with your kids and tell them, I may not live 30 more years, but I want you to know where I'll be. And I want you to know in whose hands I'll be. He wants us to write letters to our widows and to visit them and stir them on to help them in their grief and to enter into their grief, pointing them to true hope and true help in Christ. And if you're not a Christian, you have no hope that death for you is not going to be a sleep like it's used in this passage. It's going to be a nightmare. And you're going to wake up and it's going to be real. And Paul would say to you, believe, trust, turn. I know you think you're strong. I know you think you're invincible. But death is stronger than you. Jesus is stronger than death. Turn to him in faith. Confess your sins. Holler at me. I would love to sit down and talk with you about it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your people have been encouraged this morning about events surrounding your return. I pray for those who are grieving. The loss of loved ones. Would you draw near and comfort, not just alone by your spirit, but would you do it through this body? Would we have the joy of entering into grief of others and encouraging them to keep the faith and to, to be mindful of all that Christ has done? I pray for those who don't know you, that over the next hours and days, that you would allow the stench of death to draw them to the one who is a resurrection and a life. I pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen.